The agenda to possess the nations continues unabated. It is only Christ that transforms nations. And so once we raise Christ like disciples, we will be able to follow Christ's example. The New Testament church has not got any boundary. So don't say that this is church, this is work. No. Wherever you are, you form the temple, you are a priest, and you are a sacrifice. This is the reason for unleashing the church with the mandate of carrying the gospel to the ends of the year. The grace of God also requires something from us that we should deny ungodliness and worthy last and then live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anytime the soul is not put in check and the soul aligns itself with the body to fight against the spirit the person even though will be a christian but will be a carnal christian welcome to pentecost hour a platform for teaching training and unleashing the church to fulfill her mandate as salt and light in the world pentecost hour god's timely word to our dying world the theme for the program has been the anointing. And I'm excited to speak to you on an aspect of anointing. Anointing is a very broad subject. And we cannot be talking about the whole of anointing only this week. But I just want to look at some aspects of anointing. And in this message, I would attempt to do three things if time will permit me. The first one I want to do is to come out with the meaning of anointing and then also talk about who qualifies to receive the anointing. And then finally, I will talk about how to deepen the anointing, how to deepen the anointing. And so in this message, I'm going to look at three things so far as time would allow me. The issue of anointing has become an important subject in Christianity in these days. And all kinds of theories have been propounded, which are getting some believers even more confused. And so there are so much talk about anointing these days, and many people are talking about anointing in different ways. And so many theories and so many um, theologies, let me say, have been developed. And many of these are getting so many confused. Some believe that the anointing is in articles and artifacts, such as oil, water, arms band, etc. And so for some people, it is oil that is anointing. Some people, it is water. These days, we are even talking about sobulu and talking about uh, things like that. And so, for some people, the anointing is oil. So, when you go to church and they don't pour oil on you, you have not received the anointing. And so, an oil has to be poured on you before the person believes that he has received that anointing. And so, some people, anointing is oil. And it is water. And it is um, arms band and all that. Some other people also believe that the anointing is a reserve of and only a few people, such as pastors or prophets or people who have come to, know, to be known as men of God. And so, so for some people, um, the anointing belongs to some people. You must be a pastor and especially a prophet. And when I talk about prophet, I'm not talking about prophet can come with it all. <laughs> but you must be a prophet before you can receive this anointing. And they base their argument on the scripture that is written in Psalm 105 verse 15 that touch not my anointed touch not my anointed ones or do my prophets no harm and so for them when we talk of anointing anointing is a reserve for just a few you must be a pastor you must be a prophet or you must be someone who is seen to be um, um, a man of God for you to qualify for this anointing. And so you would realize that 
There are many misconceptions so far as anointing is concerned. And so in this message, I would attempt to handle the first two by trying to establish the fact or trying to come out with the meaning of anointing and also try as much as possible to let each and everyone understand who really is anointed and who really qualifies for the anointing. And as I've said, if time will permit me, we would also talk about how to deepen the anointing. So let me begin that what then is the anointing? When we say anointing, anointing, how many of you believe you are anointed? Lift up your hand and let me see. Yeah. So when we say anointing, what is the anointing? Let me say this, people of God, that getting a definite or a single definition for the anointing may be difficult. It is very difficult to get one definition or a definite definition for the anointing. But I believe that the anointing may be explained from various angles, from various angles. And three of them are what I want to look at this morning. And so what I'm trying to say is that when we talk of the anointing, the anointing may be explained from various angles. And I want to just highlight three of them. Number one, when we talk of the anointing, anointing is the presence of God in the life of the believer. When we say anointing, anointing is the presence of God in the life of the believer. And so the believer who is anointed is the believer who carries the presence of God. And so when we say someone is anointed, the one who is anointed is the carrier of the presence of God. And so the anointing, 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 it is the presence of God at work in the life of the believer. The one who carries the presence of God is anointed. Now, when you study scriptures very well, you will see that the scriptures reveal that anyone who was anointed was a carrier of the presence of God. Let's examine the lives of the prophets of old. You can talk about the prophet Jeremiah. You can talk about the prophet Isaiah. You can talk about Moses and the rest. These are men who carried the presence of God with them wherever they went. They really carried God's presence with them. Fast forward to the New Testament. Talk about the apostles. Talk about Peter. Talk about Paul. Talk about all the apostles. The, these are men who carried an uncommon presence of God. And so wherever they went, there was a physical manifestation of the anointing. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus that after this meeting, you will be a carrier of the presence of God. You will carry his presence wherever you go. And that is what we call the anointing. Carrying his presence with you. Carrying his presence with you. And so these people that we talk about carried an uncommon presence of God with them. And so wherever they went, we could see physical manifestation of the anointing of God upon their lives. And I pray that the Solution Center, people of God in the Solution Center, will be carriers of his presence. When we even come to the church of Pentecost, people of God, and I do not want to talk about the present generation, but I want to talk about the previous generations. And you find that our fathers carried his presence. Talk about the Nates. Talk about the Sapphos. Talk about the Yeboahs. Talk about those, them that we cannot even mention their names. They carried an unparalleled presence of God. And that is why they had so much results. And they had great and outstanding ministries. People of God, don't be deceived. The anointing is not oil. The anointing is not water. The anointing is not arms band. 
But when we talk about anointing, we are talking about carrying the presence of God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that as you go into your office, may you carry his presence into your office. I pray as you go to school, may you carry his presence to school. As you, wherever you find yourself, may you be a carrier of the presence of God. And that is what we call the anointing of God. And so let's understand that when we talk of the anointing, we are talking, number one, the presence of God in the life of the believer. Can I hear amen, church? But the anointing can also be explained from another angle. Number two, the anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believer. The power of the Holy Ghost activated in the life of the believer. The power of the Holy Ghost working in the life of the believer. It is the manifestation of the presence of the power of God in the lives of the believer. When we talk of the anointing, the anointing of God is the power of God working in the life of the believer. And people of God, this was the power that worked in the life of Jesus when Jesus was in this world. When Jesus was in this earth, the Bible says that he was anointed. But that meant he carried the power of God in his life. And so, when we talk of the anointing, the anointing is carrying the power of God or the manifestation of the power of God in the life of the believer. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And so what it means is that you cannot talk about the anointing without talking about the power of God. And you cannot talk about the power of God without talking about the anointing. You cannot talk about the anointing without talking about the Holy Ghost. And you cannot talk about the Holy Ghost without talking about the anointing. The Spirit of God is upon me because I have been anointed. May we carry the power of God. And I'm expecting to see young men and young women who carry the power of God in their lives. Wherever they go demonstrating the power of God, healing the sick, proclaiming good news to the poor, setting the captives free, and raising up the dead because we carry something that is unique and that is the power of God. And that power of God is what we call the anointing of God. And so the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set the liberty to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor let me say one more time the anointing is not oil the anointing is not water the anointing is not arms band but when we talk of the anointing, we are talking about the power of the Holy Ghost at work in the life of the believer. May there be a release of the power of God this morning. And may we carry the power of God wherever we go. Because that is what we call the anointing. So I remember in the scriptures, so many years after Jesus had departed from earth, or some days after Jesus had departed from the earth, Peter began to give a testimony and he says that how God anointed Jesus Christ with what? With the Holy Ghost and with what? Power. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. You see, God's power contains the anointing of God. Any of these statements is true. The anointing of God contains the power of God. And the power of God contains the anointing of God. And so if we want to be anointed, just go for the power. And once you receive the power, you have received the anointing. This morning in the name of Jesus, I came to announce to somebody that receive the power of the Holy Ghost. And may you be anointed. And so when we talk about the anointing, we are talking again 
about the power of the Holy Ghost. But that is not enough. The anointing can also be explained from another angle. And we talk of the anointing, we are talking about the enabling grace of God which he releases unto his people. The enabling grace of God. And when this enabling grace comes upon the believer, it is this grace that causes the believer to do things that ordinarily he could not do. The enabling grace of God, which he releases unto the life of the believer, and which enables the believer now begin to do things that ordinarily he will not do. It is this enabling grace that we call the supernatural ability of God upon a vessel or a person. The supernatural ability of God upon a vessel or a person. And that is what we call the anointing. It is the enabling grace of God. That grace that comes when it comes upon the believer causes the believer to be able to do things that ordinarily he will not do. It is that which is called the supernatural ability. An ability that is supernatural. An ability that is not ordinarily. So the supernatural ability of God that is released upon a person or a vessel. And this is the anointing. And I'll give you an example from the scriptures. You will remember that the disciples were ordinary brothers, ordinary men. And the Bible described them that they were not too much educated. They were unlettered. They were ordinary people. But one day, these two disciples decided to go to church. And when they were going to church, in front of the church auditorium, lied a cripple. A cripple who had been crippled for so many years. And every day he comes and sits in front of the church auditorium. And when you are going into the auditorium, he will ask of you. Or he will beg for arms. And every day he has been doing that for so many years. And these two disciples decided to go into the auditorium that day to go and worship and to fellowship. And as they went, the man saw them and began to desire something from them and said in his head, I believe, that once these two people are coming, I am sure I'll get something from them. And this man came. But what the blind man or the cripple didn't know was that something had happened. And that these two men had received that divine grace, the enabling grace, the supernatural ability from God. And so the Bible says that as he looked at them, then the apostle said, just look at us. Just look at us. But silver and gold I do not have. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man was just sitting down. I'm sure probably he thought Peter was joking. And the Bible says that Peter just held him by his hand, got him up. Then immediately, this man, who had been crippled for a long time, began to jump. He stood up and began to jump, praising God, worshiping God. But the question I want to ask is this, what had happened? Is it not the same Peter who denied Jesus three times before? Is it not the same Peter who denied Jesus? Is it not the same disciples who could not even pray when Jesus was away? could not pray for that sick person to be healed. But now, they stand before a cripple and command the cripple to stand and walk in the name of Jesus. What had happened? They had received a supernatural ability. 
they had received the enabling grace. Today, I came to prophesy on you that you will receive a supernatural ability. There is a divine grace that is coming upon the life of someone. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will carry that divine grace. You will carry that supernatural grace that after this meeting, you will go and turn the whole of Obuasi municipality upside down. Because you carry something. You carry the supernatural grace. You carry the divine grace. You carry the enabling grace. And so when we talk of the anointing, the anointing is nothing but the supernatural grace that God releases unto his people. Shall we rise to our feet? The enabling grace. The power of God. The presence of God. You want to lift up your hands. Oh, Rabba Sekabea. Liba Kabo. Rabba Sekabea. transforms the believer from ordinariness into extraordinariness. It is this enabling grace that transforms the believer from the natural to the supernatural. It is this enabling grace that enables the believer to do things which he ordinarily cannot do. It is the presence of God. It is the power of God. It is the enabling grace of God that is released unto his people. You want to lift up your head. Abide under his anointing. Under his Abide and anointing. His presence, His presence upon your just in the hands of Jesus. The source of the anointing which is genuine comes from God. The source of this anointing is God and no other person and no other thing. Anything called anointing which is not from God is demonic and satanic. It is not genuine. The Bible says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he says, you, you, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Anything else is counterfeit. Anything else cannot come 
from God. The source of the oil, the source of the anointing is one. And that is God. And today it is him you stand before. And I pray in the name of Jesus. May he release that oil upon your head. It is this oil that will cause you to transform your world. It is this oil that will cause you to change your world. It is this oil that will cause you to have an impact in your world. And I pray in Jesus' name that as you stand before him, may he pour fresh oil upon your head. Because the source of genuine anointing and oil is one. And it is God. Go to the source. Go to the source. If there is anything, we should go to the source. Now let me show you something. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Give me Matthew chapter 25, please. We are still standing. Matthew chapter 25, verse 9. Now you remember that the Bible says that the bridesmaids were waiting for the bridegroom and all that. And, and the oil, some of them, the oil finished and all that. And then those whose oil was finished went to them who had sped and said that, give us some of your oil. And they look at their reply. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. And you, instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourselves. In other words, what they were saying was that go to the source Hallelujah. and get your own oil. Glory God. The anointing, we don't beg for the oil. The anointing, we don't beg for the oil. But the anointing, you buy. But you go to the source and buy. You buy with faith. Faith is the currency with which we buy the oil. Go to the source. Come on, lift up your hands. Lift up your voice and go to the source. We don't buy, we don't beg for the oil. But you go to the source. Go to the source. Faith is the currency with which we buy the oil. Go to the source. Lift up a prayer. Go to the source. 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 Listen. Listen. Listen to what they say. There may not be enough for both of us and you. There are some of us, anyone we see, we, we give our head, anoint me. Anyone we see, anoint me. Anyone we see, anoint me. But I came to tell you that the anointing you go to the source. And the source is one. The source is one. The source is one. And the people are saying that instead, go to those who sell the oil. And buy some for yourself. Today I came to tell you that go to the source. Go to the source. But I've told you that it is by faith that we buy this oil. It is by faith. 
It is by faith that we receive this oil. Lift up your hands, please. Lift up your hands. Go to the source. Go to the source this morning. You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. Go to the source. Shall we lift up our hands? Beautiful Nazareth. Wonderful friend of mine. Oh, let me get oh. on your feet. And so, the question now is, is the anointing a reserve of a few people? Is it for pastors, prophets alone? Or those we call men of God, is the anointing a reserve of them alone? And I want to attempt to answer this question. Who qualifies for the anointing? You see, the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament. And so for us sometimes to understand the anointing or certain things, we go back to the Old Testament and then we can get a, what the intention of God. And so for us to understand who qualifies for the anointing, let's go back to the Old Testament and let's look at what God actually did in the Old Testament. God instructed Moses in the book of Exodus, to prepare an anointing oil. This oil was to be prepared with specific ingredients described by God himself. But one of the things, or one of the characteristics of the oil was that the oil was meant for specific people and specific things. Let's look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 22 to 28. The Lord said to Moses, 
take the finest spices of liquid, myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much. That is 250. And 250 of aromatic uh, cane. And 500 of casia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hint of olive oil. Next. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer, and it shall be holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offerings with its utensils, and basin, and its stand. And so here, we can first of all see that the oil was meant for the tabernacle or the temple and everything within the, the temple. I am saying that the anointing oil that Moses prepared was not meant for just anything, but the anointing oil was meant for the tabernacle or the temple and those things that were within the temple. And so the first one or the first thing that qualified for the oil was the tabernacle. But when you go to when you go to verse 30 of the same chapter, the Bible says that you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. Verse 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them and they may serve me as priests. And so the second category of people who actually qualify for the oil were priests. You must be a priest before you will qualify for the oil. And so first of all, the tabernacle, and secondly, the priest. If you were not a tabernacle or you were not a priest, you would not qualify for the oil. The oil, remember, the Bible describes it as the holy anointing oil. And this holy anointing oil was meant for the tabernacle and that which was within the tabernacle. And not only the tabernacle, but also the priest. Number three. Later on, the office of the king, which was instituted at a later time in the life of the Israelites, also received the oil. So when the office of the king was instituted, kings were also anointed. When you come to 1 Samuel chapter 10, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, the Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be a prince over the people of Israel? And so you realize that kings also qualified for the oil. So we have learned that the tabernacle, number two, we have learned not only the tabernacle, but also priests. And number three, we have also learned that the kings. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, when David was also ordained or anointed the king, the Bible says that Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And so when David was also becoming a king, an oil was poured on him. Saul, an oil was poured on him. And David, an oil was poured on him. And so you, for you to have qualified for the oil, you must be a tabernacle or a temple. Number two, you must be a priest. Number three, you must be a king. Now let's come into the New Testament. I am happy to announce, people of God, that in the New Testament, every child of God qualifies for the oil. Bigger aim in church. Yeah. I am saying that in the New Testament, every, every child of God qualifies for the oil. I am happy to say that in the New Testament era, the sacred anointing oil is not reserved for only special people. And it's not reserved for only special places or special items. So far as the New Testament era is concerned, but every child of God qualifies for this oil. And it will not matter whether you are old or young. It will not matter whether you are a pastor or not. Once you are a child of God, 
you qualify for this oil. And I will prove from the New Testament for you guys to understand. In the Old Testament, we said that for you to receive the oil, it must be a tabernacle or a temple. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19. The Bible says that. Or do you not know that you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so if tabernacles, if temples qualify for the oil in the Old Testament era, in the New Testament era, when we talk of the tabernacle, we talk of the temple, it is not this building that we are seeing, but it is the child of God. It is the body of the child of God. Your body has become the temple. Your body has become a tabernacle. Your body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so if oil was poured on temple, then I came to tell you that you are more than qualified to receive it. Because your body is the temple of God. Can I hear amen? amen. Are you following me, church? Yes. But I still have some good news. Because in the Old Testament era, for you to have qualified to become, to receive the oil, you must, you must be a priest. But the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, that you are a chosen race and a royal word. So who is a priest here? <laughs> who is a priest here? In Revelation chapter 1, 5 to 6, the Bible says that, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us and from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us. He has made us what? Ah, Kobahanda Bay. So you are a priest. And so in the Old Testament era, if the priest received the oil and the priests were given and anointed with oil, then in the New Testament era, when we talk of the priest, the child of God is a priest. You are a priest of God. And so you qualify for the oil. I came to tell you, don't let be anyone deceive you. Don't be deceived by anyone. The Holy Ghost is for each and every one of us. The oil is for each and every one of us. Because our bodies have become the temple of God. And not only have we become the temple of God, we have become priests of God. Can I hear amen, church? And the third category of people who received the oil were kings. And I will go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says that, but you are a chosen race. You are royal. You are royal. Revelation chapter 1, 5 to 9. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and he has made us, <laughs> he has made us, I said he has made us. Ah, uh, so who is a king here? Who is a priest here? Who is the temple of God here? And so who qualifies for the oil? Lura Babaka Betayanda. Begin to speak in that language. Begin to speak in the heavenly language. Luka Beta Banda Rabasekaya. Abba Rabaseba Yanda Rabasanda. Lura Babaka Be Rabasanda. Liba baba bara basaka be Iba baba baka banda lori anda come on lift up your voice you are a tabernacle you are a priest you are a king and the oil is for you just tap into the oil just tap into the oil just tap into the oil Liba baba seba tap into the oil people of god tap into the oil Tap into the oil. You are a priest. You are a tabernacle. You are a king. Ambada Masaya. Lura Mabada Masaya. Nikabara Masaya. Tap, 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 tap into the oil. 
Tap into the oil. We bow before your throne. Waiting for your touch, Lord. Come on, lift up your hands wherever you are. Anoint us with fresh oil. Holy Jesus, Ghost. Jesus. And I want you to understand your position in the Lord. That you are a tabernacle. Yes, Lord. You are a temple, number one. Number two, you are a priest. Jesus. For we are a chosen generation, chosen a royal generation. priesthood. Yes, he has made us priests. Yes, Lord. And number three, not only are we tabernacle. Not only are we priests, but we are we kings. Are priests. The Hallelujah. Bible says that for we are a royal priesthood. And in Revelation, it says, He has made us kings and priests. Hallelujah. And that is who you are. And listen carefully. You are who God says you are. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Not debatable. How you appear doesn't matter. How you look like yes, doesn't matter. Yes, Lord. But you are who God, God says, says you, you are. are. Hallelujah. And who does he say you are? I am a he king says that you priest. are a temple. Ah, he a says king. you are a priest. You says you are a I king. A king. Listen, if you forget everything I will say, don't forget this one. And because of this, you qualify for the oil. Why? Because in the Old Testament era, it was the tabernacle it was the priest and it was the, the king. kings that received the oil. But in the New Testament era, you, one person, you are all in all. You are a priest. You are a temple. You are a king. And so you qualify for the oil. Come on, lift up your hands and begin to pray. Tap into the oil. Tap into the oil. Tap into the oil. Tap into the oil. I don't know whether you know this song. Give me oil in my life. 
Keep me Keep burning. Me burning. Give me all in my life. I pray. Sing it out, sing it out, sing it out. Give me all in my life. Keep me burning. briefly on how to deepen this anointing. You see, it's important for us to note that once the believer receives the anointing, he can go deeper into it or grow in the anointing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. You have been anointed by the Holy One. The you refers to who? Oh, it refers to who? Yeah. You, the child of God. I, as I stand here, we have been anointed by the Holy One. Now, this scripture suggests that Every believer has some basic level of anointing. Every believer has some basic level of anointing. But I believe, however, that the believer must make effort to go into deeper or to go deeper into the anointing. So the scripture suggests that every one of us has basic level of anointing. We all have been anointed by the Holy One. The Holy One, God, we have been anointed by Him. And so we all have the basic oil, but there are levels. And you can grow deeper into it. So let me suggest two ways by which we can go deeper. Listen carefully. Listen to this statement very well. The harvest is in the deep. The harvest is always in the deep. The harvest is not at the peripherals. The harvest is in the deep. When you go to when you go to the seashore Eh? or the riverside and there are fishermen you will see that there are about two categories of people there are those who play around the the seashore and that kind of thing those people they don't come with they don't come home with any catch then we have the second category of people those who rather go deeper into the sea but when they are coming back they come back with a catch so, the truth of the matter also for is that the harvest is always in the deep. And that is why Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, verse 4, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, or Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
And then verse 6 says, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Listen carefully. And now, this is the secret. We must learn to go into the deep if we want to grow into the anointing. If we want to grow in the anointing, you must learn to go into the deep. Don't stay at the peripherals. No. Go deeper. Listen carefully. We must get to that level where we cannot stand but the only thing that we can do is to swim in the oil. That is all. We must get to that level where we cannot stand any longer. But we can, the only thing that we can do is to swim. And so if we want to grow in the anointing that we have received, we must learn to go deeper. Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 5. Again, he measured a thousand. He measured a thousand. And it was a river that I could not pass through. For the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in. A river that could not be passed through. Ah, Solution center. I came to encourage you. You must not remain at the ankle level of anointing. No. I came to encourage you. You must not remain at the knee level. And you must not remain at the waist level. Listen. Each and every one has, according to First John, each and every one of us has basic level of oil. But we must go deeper. We must go deeper. Also, we must go deeper. We must go deeper. We must go deeper. We must go deeper to the extent that if you minister in songs, your songs will not become ordinary, but it will begin to break chains. We must go deeper. And Ezekiel says that it got to a point in time that he could not even stand in the water because he had moved from the ankle, he had moved to the knees, he had moved to the waist level, and then again he measured a thousand cubits and then he went further. And the Bible says that at that level, he could not stand. He could not stand. He could not stand at all. The only thing he could do was to swim. I pray in the name of Jesus that we shall rise up and move into the deep. Don't become complacent with what the Lord is using you for today. For there is much, much, much more he can do with you. At whatever level that you have got into, there is much, much, much more that he can do with you. You must move on, move on, move on till you get to that level that you cannot even stand. But you can, the only thing you can do is to swim. At that point in time, your whole body, your whole spirit, your whole soul have been saturated by the water. Have been saturated by the water. Listen, when you are wet like that and you come out of the water and you are going, you see that the water is dripping down, isn't it? You see the water dripping down. You see, it is at that point in time that you can make any Sing it out, sing it out, sing it out. Your presence. Your presence. Yeah.